Welcome to PA Voter Information Network. This is Larry DiMarco, your host. Hi, and welcome to another episode of PA Voter Information Network. I am your host, Larry DiMarco. This week, I have a video on fundraising. My wife asked me to record her giving a communication and leadership presentation to nonprofit executives related to fundraising. I thought it was one of the best on the topic I ever saw. Toward the end of the video, she does a short exercise, and I encourage you to participate, follow along. If you can take your electronic device into a quiet place, I think you'll really find it beneficial. It, it can improve the way you make first impressions. So sit back and enjoy, and feel free to chat along. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Thank you. OK, if they haven't had your caffeine yet, there's plenty more back there. But otherwise, I'm thrilled to be here. I'm really honored to be the keynote this morning because everyone who's here in this audience is here for one single reason. You all work for incredibly important causes, providing invaluable services to people across the country and beyond. But you can't do it without the financial support of generous donors. So the question then becomes, when there are so many people out there trying to vie for the same dollars, how do you get more people to say yes to you? The short answer is, you have to master the three C's of vocal executive presence. Be able to command the room, connect with the audience, and close the deal. To do that, there are a few key principles you need to remember, but it all starts with a mindset shift. For a lot of fundraisers, there's an inherent discomfort in one of the most fundamental duties in fundraising, picking up the phone and calling someone for the sole purpose of asking for money. There can be a feeling of awkwardness, a dread that this is maybe not a call that people are looking forward to receiving. Oh gosh, it's another person asking for money, which can make you start to worry. Will they feel like I'm bothering them? And even, should I be better at this? Well, this is where the mindset shift needs to take place. Because you cannot think about fundraising in terms of asking for money. Asking is a question. Asking a question like that puts them in a position of power over you. It frames the situation as, I'm asking you to be so kind as to help me. I am the needy one. You are the powerful one. You have all the cards. I have none of the cards. You are the prize to be won. And if I'm lucky, I'll win. This is the wrong mentality. When you communicate with any donor or prospect, your job is not to ask a question. Your mission is to speak to lead. Your goal is to get them to see you as a leader whose vision they want to follow. You are in the position of power. You are inviting them to join you on a mission, and there's no other mission they'd rather be on. In order to help them see that, you have to find your leadership voice. Your leadership voice has two parts. The first is your figurative voice. Some might call it your author's voice, meaning a clearly honed message and broader vision. The second part is your literal voice, the sound and feel of that message as it comes off your lips, how it rings in their ears and lands in their stomach. This is not an either or option. Influential leadership requires both. That's because leadership at its core is an image. It's all about how you're perceived and how that image influences other people's thoughts, feelings, and actions. Venture capitalists and other investors have an expression, bet the jockey, not the horse. What this means is that a horse that's predicted to win, if ridden by a mediocre jockey, inevitably will neither win, place, or even show. But a truly expert jockey can take a horse that may not be the favorite and get that horse to perform beyond anyone's expectations, leading the way to victory. Ultimately, before people bet on your horse, your idea, your charity, your request. They have to buy into you first. So what, what is it that makes people buy into you as a leader whose vision they want to follow? First and foremost, you need to sound credible. But how do you establish credibility? Here's a little framework for you. When you speak to someone, you communicate your message through three channels all at the same time. Imagine a triangle. On the first side, is the, the first channel is the verbal channel. This is the figurative voice that we discussed earlier. It's the content of your message. Word choices, organization, stories, statistics, details, and whether or not you use fillers like, um, like, 
you know, I mean, it's your transcript, if you will. But raise your hand if you've ever gotten into an argument with someone where one person gets mad and the other one says, why are you mad? What did I say? And the response is, it's not what you said, it's how you said it. Anybody been there? A few, maybe, today? The fact is, it's both. Yes, what you say has to be clear, accurate, and compelling. But how you say it has to be equally compelling in a complementary way. This brings us to the other sides of the triangle, which look at the delivery of your message. The second side is the vocal channel. This is your literal voice. What does your message sound like? Do you talk too loud, too soft, too fast, too slow? Do you mumble? Does it sound flat and disinterested, timid, aggressive, or like you're just going through the motions rather than enthusiastic and speaking from the heart? Do you race through everything hoping to finish what you want to say before they cut you off? Or do you pause at strategic moments, letting your message sink in? But the how you said it part of your message has another piece that also influences that literal voice. The third side of the triangle is your visual channel. It's your body language, from your posture, hand gestures, eye contact, and facial expressions, to the way that you're groomed or dressed. Want to know what your visual channel is communicating? Video record yourself talking, then watch the video on mute. What's most important in establishing credibility is that all three channels are reinforcing each other. In the course of a single conversation, your words, voice, and body language may need to project confidence, sincerity, passion, empathy, gravity, friendliness, and more, depending on the context. You can only accomplish this when all three channels are in alignment with each other at all times. The problem is that more often than not, we don't realize that we're not in alignment. Research shows that when what you say doesn't match how you say it, your audience gives vastly more weight to your delivery than to your actual content when they're judging you and your message and your credibility. When they don't match, people lose confidence in you and you lose that credibility, which means that you don't sound like a leader that they want to follow. This happens because we all have a blind spot. We know how we want to come across. We know how we think we come across, but we are not as clear on how we actually come across when we speak. Don't believe me? Raise your hand again if you've ever watched yourself on video and thought, wow, that sounded a lot better in my head. Or, what was I doing with my face? <laughs> the revelation is evidence that your verbal, vocal, and visual messaging are not in alignment as often as we think. To make matters worse, when you're making calls on the phone, there's no direct visual message, which makes your vocal channel ne carry nearly all of the weight in trying to match what you say with how you say it in order to sound credible. So let's take a deeper look at those two channels, the verbal and vocal. First, we'll explore the verbal channel, your figurative voice, the content of your message. I want to focus on one specific skill set here. For you, storytelling is going to be one of your most powerful tools in connecting with your audience. There are three levels of impact a story should have. A good story should make people think differently about something. A great story will make them feel differently about it. But a truly inspiring story will change the way people behave as a result of it. What makes a story so powerful? You have to find a way to make it relatable. Sometimes finding that connection is easier than others, but when it clicks, that's when you've struck gold. For example, this past winter, I coached someone who was preparing to give a TED talk. Up until 10 years ago, He'd been on the top 10 list of the most violent prisoners in the UK, number six specifically. He had committed every kind of heinous crime imaginable up to and including attempted murder, and he was proud of it back in the day. The details were beyond gruesome. But while he was in prison, much to his own surprise, he had a massive conversion experience, found God, and completely turned his life around. Now, a decade later, a completely different person and a free man he had the chance to share his story on the TED stage. So one day we're talking about how to frame his story, and he asked rather dubiously, how do I make being in maximum security prison relatable? 
reasonable question. Now, while he might not have been able to get the audience to relate to the incarceration itself, he was able to share some other details, like having been mercilessly bullied as a child, which helped the audience to understand and relate better to how his journey began, because bullying is a problem that tugs at everyone's heartstring in modern society. But sometimes it's even the smaller details that offer a glimpse of relatability in their humanity. When I asked him to tell me about his conversion journey, he said that it all started when one day the guard told him to go see the chaplain. He wasn't religious, he had no interest in God, but he also had nothing better to do, so he figured he'd take a walk. He went down to the chaplain's office and realized that he'd walked in on an alpha meeting, which teaches Christian formation for male inmates. Now, this was the last thing he wanted to participate in, so he turned to leave and was about to walk out the door when another inmate whispered something that would forever change his life. He said, hey, if you stay, you get cake. <laughs> now at first, I wasn't sure I heard him correctly, so I checked. Cake? He said, yeah, cake. You don't see a lot of cake in prison, so I stayed. <laughs> and week after week, he went back to that meeting for one single reason. Cake. cake. That was the unexpected beginning to his conversion journey. But think about it, how relatable is that? Whether or not we've had a religious conversion, how many of us have been persuaded to do something that we really did not initially want to do because of the promise of a little reward, like candy or pizza or a cocktail of some sort, or cake? In that moment of pure humanity, inside that hardened criminal shell, we saw a glimpse of the innocent five-year-old in each of us. His story completely captivated his audience. And what was his call to action? What behavior was he trying to inspire? To trust that with the right opportunity, people can change. Because there's a little cake-motivated child living inside of everyone. And our job is to find her and give her a second chance. That's the power of the verbal channel, your figurative voice. It's the foundation of your vision and message. The next step is to master how you say it, delivering your story in a way that grabs hold of your listener and won't let go. This is where your literal voice comes into play. The second channel, the vocal channel, will determine whether or not you convince me that you can get the horse across the finish line first. Let me share three common vocal pitfalls to avoid as you're running toward that finish line. First is what's known as vocal fry. For example, do you tend to start strong but then kind of trail off at the end of your sentences and have this croaky, throaty, gravelly voice? If I do that, do I sound really inspiring? <laughs> of course not. Sounds like maybe I was interested at first, but then as I got going, I started to second guess myself and maybe have some doubts. It also sounds like I'm not really interested in being here. Maybe I just woke up and I'd rather be doing something else. I'm physically present, but not mentally. I'm just going through the motions. The problem is if I don't sound like I'm enthusiastic about my own point, why would you be? Use good breath support. Breathe from the diaphragm and allow a full stream of air to flow past your vocal cords, letting the ends of your sentences be as strong, powerful, and meaningful as the beginnings. The second pitfall is called upspeak, which is that pattern where it sounds like you're asking lots of questions, even when you're not, because you're inflecting all those question-like tones at the ends of your phrases and sentences. Now, maybe you don't raise it quite as much, so it just sounds like monotonous droning, but either way, it gets really annoying. And nobody wants to follow someone like that. But regardless of how high you go, those little upward glides in pitch, are actually implying tag questions, like okay, right, you know, all of which have one sole purpose. They are begging for affirmation. They sound like I need you to tell me that you believe that I'm right, that you think that what I'm saying is okay. Well, if I'm calling you and asking you to validate me, that doesn't sound like I'm very confident in my own message. So if I'm not confident in myself, why would you have enough confidence in me to entrust me with your money, of all things? 
Make sure it sounds like you are crystal clear in your intention. Your inflection should imply, I'm making a statement. You need to make sure that you use your voice with a declarative tone, letting your voice drop at the ends of sentences if you want to sound passionate, enthusiastic, and confident. Pitfall number three is the run-on sentence. It's particularly important because if you can avoid it, you can also most likely avoid the first two pitfalls as well. Don't you hate getting an email that's one giant run-on sentence with one period at the end and a thousand commas in the middle? Well, that's the way most people speak. And it's just as exhausting to listen to and process spoken run-ons as it is to understand them when they're written. Even when people are reading from a script with periods written in, the delivery often sounds like it's a run-on sentence, and it, that tends to sound like you're disorganized or self-conscious and maybe even frantic, which completely undermines any effort of projecting confident leadership. <sighs> just like we need to see periods, we need to hear them too. Finish your thought and add that vocal period at the end, letting your voice drop, then pause. That's the vocal equivalent of the space bar after the period. Start your next sentence and do it again. Pauses allow the listener's brain to catch up with their ears and digest what you're saying. Plus, they allow you to breathe, enough to avoid vocal fry, and those downward periods help you avoid upspeak. Altogether, you project a sense of calm and control, which inspires your listener to have more confidence in you. So vocal fry, upspeak, and run-on sentences are the three pitfalls to avoid in projecting leadership in that vocal channel. By the way, guys, don't fool yourself into thinking that vocal fry, upspeak, and run-on sentences are just a millennial female valley girl kind of a thing. It is not. Men and women, older and younger, educated and less educated, professional and non-professional, of every background, fall into all three of these habits from time to time. They just don't realize it because of the blind spot. And it's equally destructive to everyone's credibility and leadership image. Now, if you're on the telephone, the visual channel may carry less weight, but don't think that you're completely off the hook with it. Just because the other person can't see your face, it doesn't mean that they don't know what you look like because they can hear it. They can hear whether or not you're slouching. They can hear your facial expressions. Did you know that when you're on the phone, People can hear whether you're smiling or not. They can also hear whether your eyebrows are up or down. Did you know that they can hear whether you're, just, whether you're gesticulating as you're talking to them? They can hear all of this because the physical changes in the rest of your body directly influence the sound of your voice and your vocal delivery. So keep a mirror by your telephone and check yourself every now and then as you talk. What message is your face and body sending that the other person will be able to hear even though they can't see you. And more importantly, is that message reinforcing the image you want to project or undermining it? Now that we've looked at the three main messaging channels that create your leadership voice, I'd like to do an activity with you to demonstrate how the smallest details can make the biggest impact in speaking to lead. Will you play with me? Yes. All right, in case you didn't answer, you're playing anyway. Just letting you know. And I used to teach high school, by the way, so it doesn't matter where you sit, I will find you and you will participate. <laughs> For starters, given how many calls people receive, soliciting donations, and how many people you meet networking and fundraising at different events, what's going to make you stand out from the rest? Most importantly, right off the bat, you have to make a strong, positive, and lasting first impression. So how do you do that? Well, the first thing that you say when you introduce yourself to someone is your name. But when you do that, are you memorable? By show of hands, how many people would say, let's be euphemistic, you could be better at remembering names? General human condition, yes. Well, today is your lucky day because I'm going to absolve you of half of that guilt. Because the fact is that when most people introduce themselves to you, they pronounce their own names wrong. What I mean by that is that they pronounce their names in a way that actively makes it more difficult for your brain to process and retain what they've said. But I only absolve you of half of that guilt because on the other half of the conversation, you do the same thing to them. 
You introduce yourselves to them and you pronounce your name in a way that makes it harder for them to remember who you are. So let's look at why this happens and how to fix it. Here's three key mistakes. Oops, wrong way, good button. Three key mistakes that make you and your name not memorable. Mistake number one is speed. You say your name way too fast and you just assume that they should be able to get it the first time you say it. Or, on the other hand, if you have a particularly long or complicated name, you just assume they're hopeless and they'll never get it anyway, so you give up. <laughs> but whether your name is 17 syllables long or two syllables, like Anne Smith, even when it's simple, it's not predictable. So if you say, hi, this is Laura Scala, by the time they even realize you're talking, they totally missed what you said. So you have to slow it down enough to make sure that people catch it which will probably feel unnaturally slow to you, but it will not sound slow to them. Second, mistake number two is rhythm. You don't have any. <laughs> <laughs> Most people blur their entire name together as if it's one big word, often combined with the name of the organization. Hi, this is Laura Sokolo of Vocal Impact Productions. <laughs> I have no idea if there was a name, a company, uh, something other, a state capital, a birthday, I'm not really sure what that was. If there was a name in there, I don't know if there were two pieces, three pieces, a hyphenated name, a middle name, no idea what I just heard. So we need to not only slow it down, but we need to break the names into their components so we understand how many parts there were. Mistake number three is tonality, the highs and the lows in your pitch. Nowadays, most people tend to introduce themselves like they're asking a question. Hi, I'm Laura Sokola with Vocal Impact Productions. Like, I think? <laughs> well, are you asking me or telling me? Because if you're not sure or don't sound confident in who you are, why should I bother trying to remember? None of this is effective in ensuring that people understand and remember who you are. So that's why I want to show you a new way to say your name so that it's easy to understand and remember in person or on the phone. And then we're going to do a practice activity. You ready? Yeah. All right. First, if you're wearing a name tag, take it off. No cheating. This is not my first rodeo. Okay. okay. So remembering those three rules, slowing things down to begin with, when you say your first name, you want your pitch to go up. It's like saying, I'm not done yet. So everybody hum that with me, hmm? Again, hmm? Okay. Then at the top, you're going to have a little tiny pause. That little break in sound acts as a word boundary and lets people know, okay, data point number one has been received, prepare to receive data point number two. Then on your last name, your pitch is going to fall. It's like saying, and now I'm done. There's your little vocal period. Everybody hum that with me. Hmm. Again, hmm. So your regular pattern is hmm, 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 break, hmm. Remember, put that break in the middle. Now, if you've got a middle name or a hyphenated last name, it's up, hold, and down. Up, hold, and down. Making sure there are those breaks in between each piece. So when I introduce myself, I'll say that my name is Laura Sicola. Laura Sicola. Say it with me. Laura Sicola. The ego boost is completely coincidental, I swear. <laughs> now it's your turn. All at the same time, I want everyone to say their own name three times following this pattern. This is your warm up. You ready? One, two, three. Again. One more time. All right, shake that out. Good job, good start. Does anybody think their name does not work? There's always one person who's like, yeah, mine doesn't work, it's broken. <laughs> no? All right. So here's what you're going to do. In a moment, I'm going to set you free, and you're going to stay more or less in your general vicinity, but I want you to introduce yourselves to two, maximum three people whose full names you do not know. And you're going to use this exchange. The first person is going to introduce him or herself and say, hi, I'm Laura Sokola, or whatever your name happens to be. Following the pattern, watch your speed, watch your volume, intonation, breaks, etc. 
The second person is going to repeat and confirm what they heard. All they have to say is, you said Laura Sicola, right? And you need to add that right on the end. I'll explain it in a minute. Hopefully the answer is right. Now, if it's too quiet, if it, they can't hear because there's going to be a lot of noise, if it was too fast, just ask them to say it again, something like, you know, I couldn't hear you, or just can you speak up, just so people understood why you need the repeat. However, what you will not do is this. Hi, I'm Laura Sicola. You said Laura Sicola with those inflected questions. And that's why you need to say the word right at the end of that second line, because this is a confirmation check. You are verifying that you understood correctly, but part of the blind spot is that we don't realize when our voice subconsciously has that upward inflection. So I want you to be mindful of when you want to ask a question, ask the question. Verbalize the question. Don't just let your voice subconsciously do it for you. It's a habit that we need to break. So you have to ask the word right, or else your brain will naturally inflect it. I want you to learn to control that. So if someone says to you, hi, I'm Laura Sokola, you're not going to go to the next line. Instead, your response is going to be, try again. <laughs> Two words. Now, that's the cue that says, there's a blind spot here that you can't see. So in solidarity, I'm going to let you know that what you think you're saying is not what you're actually saying. Because here's the thing, I've done this thousands of times. About 30% of you will do the wrong one. But you will only hear it when you hear someone else do it wrong. You will not hear it when it comes off of your own lips. It is almost magic. So much like requiring someone else to tell us when we've got spinach in our teeth, we need others to tell us when we're doing something that we can't hear, okay? Because we wanna make sure that we're able to project the best image. So again, if you hear the wrong, either, hi, I'm Laura Sokola, or you said Laura Sokola, what's your response going to be? Try again. Try again. That's the hint that this is the nature of the problem. Again, if it's volume or something else, too, too fast, then you can say something else just to let them know, I, I didn't hear you, something along those lines, just asking for that repetition. But the goal is always to practice the pattern. So let's do a quick warm up. And everybody who's sort of on the, this side of the room, which is, I guess, your left side, you're going to be A, people on this side of the room, you'll be B, we'll do one quick warm up, then we'll switch, and then I'll set you free to practice on your own. Ready? This side, all together, you're going to insert your own name. We're going to practice it. Ready? One, two, three. Hi, I'm B. You said... Right. Beautiful. Swap. Ready? Group A. One, two, three. Hi. You said. Right. Beautiful. Okay. Any questions? Right. I'm going to give you exactly two minutes. Two minutes to introduce yourselves to two, most three people whose full names you do not know, you may not look at their name tags. Using this exchange, don't get into schmoozing and networking, follow up with them afterwards. And then sit back down after you've got your two people. Ready? Go. Please come take your seats. Let's get ready to debrief. We have two really important questions to answer first before we officially debrief. So let's answer those two big questions that are on everybody's mind. First. Raise your hand if it just felt weird to say your name this way. Okay, that's totally normal because we're so used to saying our names in a certain way that we literally have to retrain the muscles in our vocal tract in order to be able to change the sound. It's kind of like learning to eat again but by using your fork in the other hand. It just feels weird even though it's the same action. So the answer to the first question is yes, with practice, it will become second nature to say it this way. Second, yes, question. I'm sorry. If your name is only one syllable. Tell me your name. Just give an example. Yep. Uh, so Ann Smith. Ann. 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 Bob Jones. Okay. Thank you. Sure. Any other questions? Yeah. What if they keep getting your name incorrect? And how many times do you just say? <laughs> 
So that's a whole other question. Let's talk afterward because the question is why are they getting it wrong so many times? And it's probably a combination of the three things that we just addressed. So let's talk after. Okay. So second and more importantly, the answer to the question that's really nagging at you, again, is yes. With practice, you will eventually be able to do it this new way without doing this. <laughs> But more seriously, let's debrief. How many of you, when your partner used this pattern, could understand their name clearly? Right. That's the key. And when you used the pattern, how many of the other people were able to repeat your name back to you more accurately? This is the one thing, of all the things that I teach, that people make a direct effort to come back and tell me what a massive difference it has made. That they don't have to repeat themselves on the phone five times and all sorts of other little details that get in the way of starting that relationship. But beyond the name, what's the implication? The point is that if changing little details in your vocal delivery can have such an impact on something as simple as your name, imagine the influence that you could have if you were that deliberate and strategic in delivering your message every time you opened your mouth. When your message is crystal clear, your story is relatable, and your vocal and visual delivery drive it home, you will have mastered the three C's of vocal executive presence and be able to command the room, connect with the audience, and close the deal. Find your leadership voice and find your power. From now on, when you make a phone call, don't call to ask. Speak to lead and lead your donors to helping you change the world. Thank you. I hope you liked this video on the sound of leadership and fundraising. If you did, please click the like button, forward the link to someone else who will also enjoy it, and don't forget to subscribe to PA Voter Information Network. Signing off. Tune in next time. Bye for now.